Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Clarity and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Uh, in this session, we welcome Dr. Sabita Ramlau for a presentation and discussion about the role of social capital in higher education access. Uh, Sabita is a researcher and consultant in the areas of labour markets, post-secondary education, labour market training and EDI. She has worked with NGOs, government and post-secondary education sector in the Caribbean and in Canada. She conducts research in policy and program interventions in post-secondary education and labour markets to assist people at the margins of society. Dr. Ramlal has, is a senior researcher and project manager uh, for PRISM Economics and Analysis. And she's recently finished a, a PhD researching on social capital, and she's going to be sharing the results of that research in this session today. So over to you, Sabita. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you everyone for taking some time out of your Friday evening to hear some of my work in social capital and higher education. Okay. Um, I think I'm frozen, Tristan. You might just need to click on the screen, might work. Yep. Okay. So um, before we start, I'd like to just go over uh, Bodhya's uh, view on social capital. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how social capital was used in terms of Bodhya, Coleman, and a few other researchers. And then I will provide a summary of the dissertation research related to social capital. So as I'll explain later, the dissertation uses a broader conceptual framework and theoretical framework, but this presentation will focus on social capital. So there, there, there were two reasons I, I, I did this research. First, the theoretical reason. What is the analytical value of applying social capital to critical policy research in higher education access and widening participation? Now there's a slight difference between widening participation and higher education access. So one of the things that inspired me to do this was in Ontario in 2005, there was a increased funding to increase higher education access by the ministry. Um, so it was the number of spaces that they, they expanded, they expanded funding. And there was some mention of helping disadvantaged groups, but it was not front and center in terms of widening participation to groups who normally would not go on to higher education. Now there is more, more research and more concern about that, but back then there was not so much focus. And then from a, so from a practical standpoint, my interest was how do we have policy and programs that enable transitions to higher education, particularly for people who don't normally attend. So some of the questions I had is how useful is the concept? What role does it play? What role does it play in mediating policy? And can that the body's theory of social reproduction and the co his concepts of social capital, as well as cultural capital, be applied to a developing country? So one of the concerns I had um, that was raised actually was whether this theory would be applicable in, in a developing country context. And I felt that it was. So that was something that I was testing in the research. So as you are familiar with Bodhi's approach, it's, it's, it's about your networks, your family network, your neighborhood network, your workplace, and it's also about your class position in society and access to resources and power. So social capital 
from a Boolean perspective is also closely linked to economic capital and cultural capital. So the volume of social capital is related, depends on the size of the network and the amount of economic capital and cultural capital that a person possesses. Cultural capital is displayed in the form of one of, of the ways is educational qualifications and credentials. So if you are a professor, you have a lot of cultural capital in modern society. That doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot of economic capital, but it can help. Um, and then cultural capital explains the unequal scholastic achievement of children originating from the different social classes. So if you possess the cultural capital of the elite, or you understand it better, even though you're not from the elite, then you, you can, you know the rules of the game. So cultural capital, you know the rules of the game and social capital, you know people who can help you. You, you can leverage that relationships to, to help you. So in the context of Bourdieu's theory of social reproduction, there's a focus on class and structural inequality and the role of the education system in perpetuating inequality. So he was influenced by Marx, as you can tell. So the superstructure and the education system is part of the superstructure. And key to that is the concepts of social capital, cultural capital, economic capital, and habitus. So this presentation will focus on social capital. The utility of these concepts is that it allows for examination of financial and non-financial factors that promote or impede higher education access, considering power relations in society. So while Bourdieu focused on class, uh, the theory, critical theory has expanded the usage of his concepts to categories of race, religion, gender, and other categories of interests and populations of interests. One of the things you would want to ask yourself if you are using Bourdieu in a developing country context is do you need something else? Do you need to contextualize, to contextualize your research? And for me, I used uh, post-colonial theory in a Caribbean context. So theorists from the Caribbean use some of their concepts in terms of contextualizing the research. Not so much in the analysis of higher education access, but for, to understand the history and the context and the structuring of power and class and the intersections of other variables with class. So habitus was raised in the literature in terms of individual habitus, as well as organizational and community habitus. So I, I found that sort of part and parcel of using social capital. You couldn't leave that out of the equation. So some, one of some of the some of the literature here explains the relationships. Sorry. So the students' habitus interacts with the institutional habitus to determine whether students enter higher education. The habitus of the school again reflects the community in which it is located that impact the culture, ethos, and student experience. And if you're thinking of different classes and geographical location of the different classes, then you, you sort of get an idea of how schools uh, serve that streaming purpose in society, depending on the school you attend, the class where you live. So, the habitus of the school is acquired over years and location and the neighborhood and the, the resources available to the neighborhood is key 
to that habitus. And as we discuss the research, you, you will understand how that came out. Um, so you have more opportunities, advantages to a school with students from middle income and high income areas, which works against students from low income areas. So if you live in the Upper West Side, Manhattan, you, know, you have a different access than if you live in um, the Bronx, to use a, a very international example. So Colburn did a study to demonstrate the effect of social capital in the family in the community to aid the formation of human capital, which is you know, education. And he sees family social capital as a resource for children, the same way money and education is. So families differ in his, in his data set in social capital. And he operationalizes the concept of social capital by using different variables. And this was useful to me in terms of you know, doing my own research. How, how, do, how do we understand this term that is seen as vague? How do we operationalize it in the field? So it also has an effect on education of the next generation, which was something I was interested in, intergenerational change in higher education and educational level, because as I took a very broad view in the research that had different people of different ages to see that evolution in the community in education and education policy, you can actually see how, how education policy evolves through what people tell you. Um, and so like one of the things he found was students from larger families, one parent families and those with lower maternal expectations for their child going to college impacted the likelihood of dropping out from high school. Then um, some researchers look at religion as, as part of uh, the social capital and education outcomes. So Coleman also found an independent effect of frequency of religious attendance, not the religion itself, which showed the importance of social capital because you, you, you have a network behind the church. So it, it's about the networks in the church. There's also the variation of the school types that will is a indicate whether someone drops out. So for instance, public high schools will have a higher dropout rate as opposed to uh, non-religious private schools uh, compared to the religious based or denominational schools. So in this case, Catholic private high schools. So children from those denominational schools, including other types of denomination, had a lower dropout rate based on attendance at religious events. And he suggests that the community could make up the deficits in social capital in families of students in Catholic schools. Now, based on the situation and the context of Trinidad, where I did my research, this holds very true in terms of denominational schools and the kind of educational outcomes and transitions to higher education. Now, Hussein looked at African-American students in the US and then also saw a strong relationship between religious social capital and family social capital as a predictor of college ambitions and future goals. So he used a secondary data set to test this. <clears throat> and the results indicated that students, especially males who are active in religious life involved with parents and have an active social life, have greater opportunities and choices for the future. He also suggested doing research that compares different racial ethnic groups with African-American students 
to look at student aspirations over time, over several years to highlight trends and so sort of a longitudinal study, in other words, and to look at differences among high education outcomes for religious secondary school compared to secular schools. And this is something I would actually like to do on a, on a more quantitative level in Trinidad because they, clearly, clearly there's a difference in the educational outcomes and transitions between these two types of schools. So the key findings in the research is that people, low income people have problems transitioning. So governments institute tuition policy and funding programs. However, these have not been found to be sufficient to widen participation in higher education access for marginalized groups, underrepresented groups. So the question is, when policy supports to funding exists, why does higher education access not improve in certain communities? So for instance, at a certain point at the turn of the century, higher education was expanded, the number of spaces in Trinidad, and then it had been virtually free for a few years, for a few generations, but the uptake in the case that I was doing, that I looked at, was not there. So it was not there, uh, but they had close proximity to the institutions. So that was of why I was in sort of studying that phenomenon and um, looking at the non-financial factors and how I came to settle on this concept of social capital. So the, 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 the research has found, mostly OECD research, that the parental education is the main predictor. Aspirations are also impacted by parental occupation and parental expectations, encouragement and involvement, as well as sibling support. In the community, and I forgot to mention the positive and negative signs, meaning that social capital can be positive or negative. Um, the community, uh, uh, the peers of people can influence and people in the community, as well as adults can provide information and advice. Um, now the whole idea of social capital deficits has been raised in some research, but now this has become sort of a controversial issue because what some researchers are seeing is that you're basically saying that that you're putting your lens on a community and saying these people lack lack these things and so therefore they they are sort of inferior in some way so so one has to be careful when when you speak about social capital deficits in terms of education and higher education and then there's also the habitats of the community. So Bodhya says that the habitats of the community is part of the psychosocial dynamic in higher education access. And social capital is embedded in communities and influences attitudes and aspirations in terms of reasonable expectations. So coming to the school, social capital, you have influence and advice of peers within the school and guidance as well from the institutional agents, or you may lack those things depending on the type of school. An institutional agent can be the principal, the teachers or guidance counselors. And then the habitus of the school as well that you mentioned can affect outcomes. So, in terms of extending social capital beyond class, um, as you have seen, religion has been applied and also other researchers have looked at race, indigenous peoples, gender, disability, citizenship status, uh, in terms of refugees and movements of people, religious groups and various intersections. So coming to the research, uh, what, one of my questions 
was what role has the forms of capital played in mediating higher education access for people in Orangwas, which is the case study. And we'll focus on social capital. So the town is low income. It's a former sugarcane plantation. So it has an agrarian legacy. That plantation became the town. Um, and there is a legacy of crime and gangs that sort of died away in the like i would say the 70s but that reputation and habitus is still there in the community so the target group here was the descendants of indentured laborers so once uh, slavery was abolished um they needed a labor supply the english so they brought east indians from india to work the plantations. Some people returned after five years and most stayed. So, so Arangwa's plantations was um, where, where this community developed. And so they had a minority status on arrival they, because that society had already formed and they sort of ex coexisted alongside the society that was already formed and what um, Caribbean uh, theorists call Creole society. So the, the Indians existed along Creole society. So they were also religious minorities, um, Hindu and Muslim, the majority were Hindu. And um, so I, I focus on that in terms of how that affected their chances and their transitions and their success in education. So the target group of different ages, because I wanted to capture the stories of people at different points in time. And I focused on when they attended primary school to capture that intergenerational change. So when, when I spoke to them, it was about their whole family over time. And these people attended primary school from the 1950s to 1990s. So I did, I did a bunch of interviews, but for, but for purposes of the dissertation, I focused on 13 and it used thick description and looked at people with and without higher education. So there was oversampling of people with higher education to understand how, what made them transition to higher education. But I supplemented with documentary research to provide that historical, social and particular context and the evolution of the education policy. Um, so I use proxies of social capital using the literature review, um, coded these um, as indicators of social capital. And I looked for themes related to previous research as well as new themes specific to the context. And the analysis looked at the micro level, meso level of the school and the community, and then macro structural issues of the education system and structural inequities and the, and the various policy actors involved. So this is some of the proxies that I took out of the research and um, at the family level, community and the school. And this was all pulling from the uh, literature. So basically, the concept was very useful and transfers well. There was nothing culturally specific about that the terminology and the concept that doesn't translate to a developing country context. So it confirms a lot of the previous findings on non-financial factors. So parental education, and I put formal there for a reason, for meaning they went to a formal institution, was very useful uh, as an indicator. So basically, nobody, not nobody's parents had 
high education, right? Some of them didn't even have secondary school education. So the lack of high education would be um, the fact and not the presence of high education. So it's really a non-factor then. What really mattered was the involvement and support of the parents. So when you don't have high education, that becomes more important. Expectations are also important, as well as the occupation of the parent. So, but in a different way. If you don't like that occupation of your parent, whether it's the farmer, in most cases would be a farmer, and you don't want that life for yourself, that is actually a, a incentive to go on to, to high education. Parental presence was not, did not seem to be a big factor because everyone had both parents in the, in the, in the home. So it was difficult to assess that. Sibling support was very important, especially where parents don't have secondary school education or high education, a sibling can step in. And then the intergenerational effect was seen as well in the research. So where, and I, I'll explain this later in, in one of the, the slides, where you have somebody finally get in high education, you see that change in the next generation. The nuances in the results is that the, the extended family, both kin and non-kin is much more important. So what you call family is not necessarily somebody of your blood relative, uncle or auntie is anybody in the village, right? So that extended family is very important, as well as the strong role of women. They played a bigger role in encouraging uh, uh, their children towards higher education. Um, the Caribbean is called a matriarchal place, space and the countries there. So that might be reflective of the context. Um, and one of the things that was found related to students with disabilities or children with disabilities as, is that they face a lot of barriers and shaming in the home and parents put limits on their aspirations to education and work. So they, they, they have very low probability of going on because they are, see, they are othered by their own family, given the, the culture and the context. And so for first generation students, which everybody in the sample were first generation students, the, the, the support of parents was more important because you had the free tuition, you had all that there for a lot of these people. So that was not the issue. It was the support of parents. And one, one of the curious things is because the, the Trinidad inherited the English system of high stakes testing at 11, 11 plus, let's say call it 11 plus exams and then secondary school exams. There was a whole tension around examinations which um, creates this whole industry of lessons uh, for high stake testing. And this is what, one of the main ways that low income people can help their children because they can't help them. So they, they I pay for lesson, lessons during or leading up to exam time for the children. So in terms of school social capital, it confirmed previous findings where the, the teachers have a big role in whether first generation students transition to higher education. And they have selective in their support and guidance. So they, they help the students who need less help and ignore the students who need more help because it's easier for them. Uh, help them in preparation for tests. They label and stream students in classes. So you go to this class, you, you, you are labeled as not bright or intelligent. And then that also affects the curriculum that they do 
in the secondary school I'm talking about mainly. And then that, because you're in being streamed, then your chances of going on to higher education and to A-levels and, and university in particular is, is lowered. So in terms of the structural aspect, as I mentioned, the, so the schools are two types. Private schools don't play a big role. Um, it's a place where if you, you failed your exams, you'll go. So it doesn't have that elitism that, that happens in developed countries. You either go to a public school, secular school or denominational school. And here's a sort of a logistical question. You know, the Chinese got out a readout of, of the call fairly so there's a different quality of education and student success as based on the public data in the examination results but for these students they didn't have access to those schools you are very limited in where where you can attend because of the government policy that zones students so they don't have access to top tier schools, majority of which are denominational schools, secondary schools. So they are already being set up sort of for failure. They have some guidance counselors, but there's poor support. Um, and again, if you, if you are going to a school where everybody's the same, same class, same background, social status, then there isn't a lot of information in the school among peers about going on to higher education in low tier schools. If you're in the top tier schools and the prestige schools as they are called, then you have that opportunity. That's the people who went on to higher education, one person who left the community the parents left the community, he had access to one of those denominations of schools and he did very well. And he was the one who actually got a PhD, but nobody from within the community had access to one of those types of schools. Because that is dependent on the government placing you. So unless you know somebody you have the social capital to get transferred into one of those schools, which these people didn't. Um, they had to attend whatever school they were placed in. And then the habitus of those schools, for some students, not all, for a couple of these students, they went into even worse schools. If they were placed outside of their community, it was to other spaces, geographical locations, schools located in low income communities and that had, you know, drugs and, and, and violence and the, the schools reflect the community. So for one girl in particular, it, it really demotivated her to, to like um, not attend school. She didn't, she, she lost interest in school because of the school that she was placed in. In terms of the community itself, uh, there was a lack of information and guidance generally, but there was the opportunity for the, the network of the community to help people find jo part-time jobs, to help supplement when they were going to higher education, as well as advice on school uh, from neighbors and friends. And this is on secondary school, not higher education. Like what kind of subjects to select and all that. There's, there's a lack of access to information and networks in the broader society over time and few contacts. So there's little bit, what you would call bridging social capital. So it was a very closed community. So little, little bridging social capital to other communities in the society. And there's also the spatial factor that uh, Stephen Ball has talked about in terms of where you're located. And, and so 
sometimes when you see people in certain occupations, one of the um, participants mentioned was that the, how she was able to aspire to be a chemical engineer and work in the energy sector, which is located in the south of the island, was because of her peers in, in the university. And what she learned from them was that because they lived near the jobs, where the jobs were, or even though they were agrarian, ag agricultural people, and, and but they lived near the oil refineries and the gas refining places, they saw people and they saw opportunity for jobs. So they aspired to those jobs. So they aspired to a higher education to work in those places. So they were not inspired by their parents or their community. They were inspired by the industrial um, companies that had set up, international companies that had set up there. In their, in their community. So this community was in the North and had no idea about those opportunities. So they had no aspirations towards those types of jobs. So where you are in terms of, so even though they were close to the higher education institutions, that was not an inspiration. It, it's, the, it's the proximity to where the jobs are that, that came out in the research. Something that um, was, was unexpected in the findings in, in terms of the stories was the colonial legacies of the plantation and the ongoing generational alcoholism, violence, and gender-based violence that impacts the community habitus. So this is something that's not really looked at or spoken about in the society. So this is... Um, I think it, it's part of it's part of the negative <clears throat> social capital in the community, which is deep seated. And in the thesis, I related to um, the indigenous communities in Canada and the legacies that they are still coping with, and the the problems they have in in everyday education system and, and in in the higher education system and other communities like that. So it is something that needs further research um, because it's an ongoing issue. And, and I think because this community was very sort of isolated, it continues to linger and could explain some of the, the um, lack of interest in, in uh, higher education. So an example here of one of the participants, uh, it's, this uh, network diagram is egocentric. So this person is at the middle. This is the family social capital. Now I noticed the mother is missing in this, but she, she didn't have any education because back in those days, women, it wasn't a priority for a woman to even get a primary school education. But if you look at this guy, he is actually a professor. His father didn't have, had primary school education, but he was a Hindu priest. His father, sorry. His father was also a Hindu priest who was an indentured laborer from India, which is pre-partition India. So this is actually a family of priests, and the, all the sons are priests. But even though he had no ed formal education uh, in terms of uh, just limited primary, he was a learned person for, in terms of the Hindu scriptures and all that. So what he mentioned was that his father was an inspiration for him. However, what was interesting is the father wasn't very um, impressed by him being a professor or having a PhD. He wanted his son to practice as a priest. So when he finished his PhD and became a professor, he had to go back <laughs> and be a Hindu priest part-time while he's doing his professor thing. <clears throat> 
So what that shows, look, now over here, his daughter became a doctor. So within a short space of time, from being an indentured laborer, uneducated from India, there's a quick switch over to two generations having professional degrees. And then he attended primary school with another participant who we see a little bit of here. But he had a daughter who got an MBA and became the chemical engineer. But he chose to be do informal training. And that's something that I also found in the thesis that in a developing country context, which is something the World Bank has recognized, is that the informal training system is not recognized. And that is a big part of the economy. So he sorts and his the sons all went into the father's trade. He trained his sons, who all became auto mechanics, part of the informal training system, whereas the daughter became a chemical engineer, which is quite common in the Caribbean. High education among women is outstripping men. And um, this, this is sort of an example of the men and the women taking different paths. But he went to government schools. So that whole idea that you have to go to a prestige school doesn't hold for him. And it was a choice because he was from a Hindu family. He did not want to go to a denominational school that was not Hindu. There was no Hindu schools for him to attend. So he was insistent that he attend government schools, which was at a lower level. They weren't the prestige schools. So this is an example of how I looked at the data by each person and analyzed it. Um, but what was important was the agency of each individual in all cases who attained high education. It, was, it really came down to their agency, right? So I found the concept of social capital very useful along with the other concepts of cultural capital, economic capital to understand why people were not transitioning to higher education despite policy goals to increase participation, despite the funding being there, despite the institutional spaces being there. It's not, you can build it and they will come. It actually requires um, some understanding of the phenomena, what's happening in communities like Arangues, and then provide the right policies and programs if you do want to widen participation in those communities. So that's my presentation, Tristan. Excellent, thanks, Savita. I'm really impressed with your research and the way that you've been able to inc include uh, Pierre Bourdieu's understanding of habitus and his approach to social capital. Um, while still looking at social capital more broadly and, and James Coleman and the other scholars who have, who have used that, that, that approach. But you've stayed, you seem to have stayed quite true to Bourdieu's uh, theoretical foundations. And I think that's, that's something that's quite difficult to do. Uh, so we'll, we'll open it up for questions now uh, from the audience. So you can either raise your hand uh, within Zoom or you can post your question in the chat. But I wanted to start with a question for you, just about your experience of, of doing your PhD and, and how difficult it was, like I said, to, to stay true to Bourdieu's theory and approach while using social capital. And like particularly early in your PhD, was it really difficult to understand the rest of the literature, you know, Coleman and Putnam and, and, and the rest of it? Um, yeah, it's it was, well, I, I find Bolio very difficult to read on the whole. Like I was just looking again at his um, book and it's it's really hard, tough going. But I found the, the application of his concepts in the broader theory was really helped me understand what he was trying to say. <laughs> so I actually had to read other people who, who utilize his concepts to better understand Bodhio. And then I said, you know what? This works for me because they were actually reading the uh, Ontario report. There was a higher education commission. And in my job, I was working for the university's uh, sector. Uh, as part of my job, I was reading that and, and they mentioned non-financial factors. And 
So I thought that that Bodio is would be he speaks to the non-financial factors. So so they are talking about his concepts, but not talking about his concepts. So I've noticed there are people researchers who speak to non-financial factors, but they don't use Bodio at all. But it really is about Bodio. They don't mention his name. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't cite anything from him. They, they might cite secondary other literature, but it really all comes back to his theory and um, his what he spoke about in France, 1970s France and the way the system streamed people when they tried to massify high education in France, the way it, it's sort of a lesson to what developing countries are trying to do because they expanded high education in Europe and North America, uh, but then who goes where in what institution, who goes to the Ivy League, the Oxbridge universities, and then who goes to the rest, right? And who goes to community colleges as, as is seen in the US. So I found his broader theory about social inequality much more important that, that's why I used him because we're looking at a developing country context and, and, uh, and the issue of social inequality. Yeah, so it's absolutely. because he grounded those concepts in power is why yeah. I find him so interesting. And, and that's what I'm really impressed by with your research is that you're able to stay true to that, that, con that conception in, of power and the way in which Bourdieu treats power and social stratification. And I think it's really difficult to read you know, Coleman and Putnam and a lot of the social capital literature and understand what those scholars are talking about uh, in comparison to Bourdieu's work. And I, th I think it's, you know, you can get really confused about what social capital is and, and how social capital works between these different scholars that, that see the real underlying theoretical foundations as being really quite different. And, I th and that's what I'm saying. Like, I think it's really impressive that you've been able to stay true to it. But I, like, was it really difficult in early on, especially to read Coleman and to be able to still understand, you know, Bourdieu's approach? Well, I didn't really have have an issue in terms of understanding what he was saying. But I like you, you seem to have a better grasp of the differences. I didn't really get the nuances and I realized there were differences. So I decided to be to so, sort of focus on Bodio and not get into the different interpretations because that would have confused me even more. So by sticking more to his framework that helped me and to not get bogged down with the different interpretations of social capital. Well, it sounds like a, a good tip or recommendation for anyone who wants to use Bourdieu's work is to is to stay true to that, you know, keep focusing on that, even when you're reading other social capital literature. Sounds like a good approach. Certainly worked in the end for you, I think. <laughs> so we'll move on to questions from other people. Um, Telly, did you want to unmute yourself, ask your question? Yes, thank you, Christian. Um, Sabita, I think you you made a good choice in um, sticking to Bourdieu. I don't think uh, uh, Coleman or Putman will have been any good for you, given the context uh, you were uh, working in. Just for, your, for as point of information, have you read um, Hilary uh, Beckles' uh, How Britain Underdeveloped the Caribbean? It's a new book that <clears throat> you might I, I, you might want to have a look at it. I think uh, it could What, what year was that? Is that new? Uh, I, I think, yes, it's quite new. Yes, I, I, I think it's been published this year. Uh, okay. It will maybe have been published uh, last year, but definitely um, uh, it's, it's a book I, I, I will recommend to you. Um, um, the, 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 uh, in terms of um, application of Bordeaux, I, I, um, to what extent did you really consider as, uh, the, uh, social reproduction in, in terms of uh, the colonial past, where the, the system, the education system that was established there was essentially being reproduced possibly because I, it was interesting, uh, your contrast about uh, government school and faith-based school the, uh, 
uh, the contrast in terms of maybe there is a class issue there. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, the indenture uh, communities uh, you know, uh, from India compared to the, uh, to the, uh, to the African uh, um, origin communities who were uh, uh, still possibly experiencing intergenerational trauma. I don't know whether you consider that. If not, I will, rec uh, I will encourage you to consider the intergeneration trauma and how that has been reproduced in terms of the communities who are uh, have not really aspired to higher education. So uh, uh, you know, that could be a, a, an area for you to, uh, to, to consider. Um, there was something else I, I was gonna suggest for you. Yeah, but it's essentially that I, 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 I recommend looking at the intergenerational trauma and how that is still being played out uh, and being a barrier to uh, for those communities to engage in uh, higher, higher education. So this, you know, in something you need to consider the social psychology of, of trauma mm -hmm. uh, and the perpetuation of that, which might uh, link uh, 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 with the uh, wider social and cultural reproduction. Uh, and also the symbolic violence, I mean, another uh, concept you might want to consider, the act of symbolic violence that perpetuates the, uh, uh, the structural inequalities as manifested in, in terms of uh, educational progress and, and, and access to higher education. Now, I did have like uh, a chapter on the whole context and the evolution of the education system from from uh, you know denying slaves education because that was not their purpose as well as indentured laborers and then the way the system evolved with the church playing the main role the catholic church and the anglican church being the main providers of education so that's why the the church there's a, a bifurcation in the in the institutions right because the church was was part of that system of inequity and inequality and who had access, right? So the elite would attend those few schools. But so one of the things, I don't know if you ever read Eric Williams, um, Capitalism and Slavery, that was actually his PhD thesis, the first prime minister of Trinidad. He spoke about um, how that, how colonialization and, and the, the, the um, system evolved to disadvantage people on an ongoing basis. So when he became prime minister, the education system was his priority to expand education as a means of development. And so what interested me was that they went from, because once you expand universal primary, then you move to universal secondary. The next level is higher education. And in uh, modern day society, that has now become the global discourse that developing countries need to expand higher education uh, to compete in the global, what I call the global capitalist enterprise. So universities have become part of that enterprise to provide labor for people, but I do have quite a lot on that, which I didn't really mention because we could go on forever, but, but um, it is there. And the, the, the whole evolution of the school system comes from that colonial heritage and history, as well as the English system. I had a whole, have a whole section around high stakes testing and how that has impacts on low income communities and, um, so this, this research can actually continue uh, to look at other communities who, who are, have uh, been you know, ghettoized and, and remain in poverty over generations. And, which, and that kind of sort of explains the escalating violence in the society, which, which I didn't really understand before, but now doing the research, I see where the alcoholism comes from, where the violence comes from in the society. Mm 
Yes, that, that's very much, if you look at the uh, indigenous uh, uh, communities in Australia, issues to do with alcoholism in uh, no doubt in New Zealand and definitely in, in Canada uh, context. And But it's also important to, understand, uh, to locate the education system uh, the British uh, education system is very much class-based. Another, uh, 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 another uh, 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 text I would recommend is, is uh, uh, um, Miles' uh, book on the racial contract. Um, uh, that will, in terms, uh, will help to locate much more about. Uh, 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 how racism uh, and oppression is very rooted in 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 the uh, educational experience uh, 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 in the Caribbean and also in other colonized uh, um, uh, societies. Yeah, that's why I found the Bodier attractive because even though he was writing about France, it's quite transferable to a developing country context to understand how the education system as, uh, reflects the economy and, and class and the economic system. Absolutely. Telly, would you be able to post the details of those books you mentioned in the chat? Just so if anyone's interested, they can easily find them. Uh, Telly, you're, you're muted. I'll do that now. I just need to uh, get the text. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. Well, um, I think what this this highlights, this conversation highlights, is is the value of using Bourdieu's approach and how, uh, by focusing on the habitus and understanding the habitus, it's possible to explore all of these these sources of the current situation. You know, we can look back and look at colonialism and we can look at the way in which um, past events have shaped the experience of the participants in the research context. And I think that that's not easy to do with other approaches to social capital. And it's, it's even more difficult to do if we were say using quantitative approaches. And so by using qualitative and by using Bourdieu, you're really able to dig into those, those kinds of things that really have shaped the way in which participants experience the research context. Now, one of the things I didn't do was I didn't put act because this was stories. This was the stories of people. People, I centered people instead of the institutional agents because um, I read Stephen Ball, for instance, who did some, some research in the UK and most, most education researchers center the agents and the institutional agents. And so I was listening to what people told me about their experience. So that was, that was key to the research as to how they experience policy. Like, because my, my focus is on policy and how people experience education policy and how they enact it, as Stephen Ball would say, and then what can we do about it? Because even, even in developed countries in Europe, the education system is still failing lower class people. So, so besides intersections of race and religion and all those other things in post-colonial societies, you also have the issue of class still there that, that is not changing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for many years, I taught a, a course that was just pre-university. It was a, a pathway course to university. And there was a lot of mature age students who were often from so low socioeconomic backgrounds who were first in family to go to university or to try to go to university. And certainly the experiences of a lot of these people was just the uncertainty of, of you know, what is university and, and what do I do and how do I do it? A lot of those things were the, the biggest barriers to them actually being able to, to attend. Um, was the fact that they had nobody in their family to talk to about these kinds of issues. So we can, like, I think it's really easy to see how, um, you know, social stratification can really reinforce these kinds of barriers to, to educational access. Mm -hmm. So anybody else have any other questions? Um, Marion posted a question in the chat. She's actually not able to ask it um, on herself at the moment. because she's, she's traveling. 
So she asks about the concept of institutional habitus and wondering if you had any kind of definition or an understanding of what institutional habitus might be. So, so Trent uh, was the one who used the term and also Ra who did some um, quantitative study uh, and they mentioned organizational habitus and institutional habitus. But uh, let me see if I can find that slide where. So I was trying to find what did they define as that. Um, so I had to sort of make my own interpretation of, I can't find the slide now where, where it is. So when, when we look at uh, what, um, so he, here's where she talks about Tranta. Yeah. She talks about um, how it is acquired. So the, the his school's history, where it's located, it's with the neighborhood resources. So for instance, if you're in a rich area, you, get, you can fundraise much better. Uh, the student mix. So the student mix, if you, if you have zoning, then the student mix is not a big deal. Everybody will be middle class or everybody will be lower class and the staffing. So on the second bullet, um, again, you have the school culture, the ethos. So what I see the, 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 the habitus is, is, is sort of like culture is also what I would use, but I would say it's the collective of the individual habitus that comes together and builds that organizational habitus or school habitus. Same way in the neighborhood. So around West, it has a certain habitus because of its history, because of uh, its culture, because of uh, its class, the class, the agrarian aspect of it. It's a, it's a, present time, short term orientation, which is also found in the lower class in other spaces. So Stephen Ball found that same thing in the UK. So it's, it's, it's the culture and the, the way, the disposition, the same way a person has a disposition, an organization has a disposition and a community has a certain disposition. It seems like quite a difficult thing to conceptualize because habitus really is about an individual's background predispositions but those background predispositions are shared um, right. and so you know it's that kind of interaction between the subjectivity of, a, of an individual and the way that an individual constructs their their experience of the world you know socially constructs their experience of the world but because it's socially defined a lot of those things are shared and so an institution has a whole lot of shared understandings, a lot of shared, well, the, it's not the institution has it, of course, it's the, the individuals it's the people, within yeah. that institution has it. And so the interaction between the individual uh, that possesses these predispositions themselves and the, the shared nature of the same sorts of predispositions that exist in any social grouping, it's, to me, it's a little bit difficult to, to sort of conceptualize the, the difference between the individual and, and the collective. Um, and I think that I was wondering, have you, did you look as part of your research, did you look at, at concepts like life world perhaps that, that's quite similar and the way that those, that concept is conceptualized by authors like, for example, um, uh, Habermas uh, to, to improve your understanding of habitus um, because of the similarity? No, I never really looked at that, but that's a good one. I will check it out, Tristan. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, so life world is is um, defined very, very similarly to habitus. You know, it's the, the background presuppositions. And so um, if we're talking about Jürgen Habermas, then we're talking about his his concepts of system and life world. And so the life world is just those those background presuppositions. Um, but again, like just like with with habitus, there, there seems to be this little bit of a disconnect where 
life world is talked about in the context of an individual, but clearly there is a, a shared life world that exists. A collective, yeah. yeah. It's, it's what we, we would have called cult organizational culture in, in management theory, right? Right. Uh, and so that, that individual with a certain habitus coming into an organization with a certain habitus or culture may not fit it. You have to fit that organization, but it's really the collective of people who have developed that culture in that organization that you have to become part of. So then you have mm. to change your individual habitus to fit into that collective because life is social. So what, what, even though we say we have an individual habitus, that individual habitus was shaped by that community habitus, let's say in our ways, that then impacts how you interact in the school. So for instance, if you attended, which happened with my sister, actually, she got into one of these prestige schools and she could not fit in. She had a hard time and she dropped out uh, uh, from a levels, right? And I was talking to her, telling her about my research. And then she started talking about her experience. And then I understood that there was a class issue, the people had different kind of lifestyle from her. And so she, her habitus was different from that institutional habitus and the individual habitus of her schoolmates. So, so the same thing happens at university as well when you enter and that's why you have transition year programs for people from uh, disadvantaged communities because it's a culture shock when the because the university is a very elitist space. It was, its history is about elitism. And even though it has been massified, it's still built on certain traditions of elitism that is hard for um, disadvantaged people or people from different cultures to negotiate. And it gets even worse if you go to um, one of the top prestige one, the Ivy League, it gets even worse when, when you go there. That's why you see people prefer two-year community college because it's easier for them. Mm, yeah. I mean, as you've been talking, I, I've been thinking, you know, is, is social capital habitus? Like, is that an easier way to think about what social capital is? It's... Uh, I had I had difficulty separating the two when I was thinking about it, but I I think one if I would I I thought of social capital mainly as the, the information I can get what I can leverage from people, what can Tristan give me that can help me as opposed to that sort of way of being and disposition. That's how I saw the difference. Yeah. I really see capital as key there where what's in it for me, like what, what information, what resources, what, what can help me in terms of education. That's how I looked at it, just differentiated from the idea of habitus, which is more your disposition. Yeah, because I think Bourdieu's definition of social capital to me um doesn't really get at what it is you know what he really means by it um but i guess he's really focused on how it how those predispositions that habitus becomes capital you know becomes value and so when he talks about the the actual and potential resources that are embedded in a institutionalized network you know to me that sort of distracts us from what he really means by what social capital is but he's very focused on the capital part and so thinking more about how social capital may be perhaps the nature of our habitus, particularly the shared habitus, um, to me, it makes a lot more sense. But of course, it, it doesn't focus so much on the capital, you know, on the potential to produce certain kinds of uh, actions or outcomes. Um, but I think it's really useful to think about it in those kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Marion's posted a couple of other comments. Um, she can't actually unmute and, and talk at the moment. She's, she said, um, perhaps we can work on understanding this institutional organizational habitus better in our research group. I think that's, that's certainly something that we can look at. And also that her research looks at the differences in strategic thinking between commercial and non-profit strategic thinking. 
Uh, so I think her, your presentation today, I think, has probably helped her research as well, as I'm sure other people who are attending as well. Uh, so there's another question from Aminal. Aminal, did you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Savita, for your nice presentation on social capital role for uh, higher education. Uh, what is the background of your uh, uh, social capital research on this higher education um, perspectives in India? So what is the utility in terms of uh, in, in India? Yeah. I would say it would be very useful. Um, India, is, India is a much more complicated society. Um, and in terms of religion and ethnicity and, and caste. So you would have to like be very careful in how you operationalize it and what you focus on. For, for me, I, I didn't raise it here, but caste did raise his head here by showing you the, the priests, the group of priests, they were Brahmin, right? And the reason I didn't explain, because it's that's cultural capital. Caste gave them cultural capital in the community. So instead of serving his indentureship, somebody bought out his contract for him, right? This is the guy who came from India, the grand, grandfather of Prem, the, the one who became the professor. So what I saw there in my discussion of cultural capital, which I didn't have in the slide, was that there was a habitus in that family that, and a cultural capital based on them being priests and based on his position as a Brahmin that gave, him, gave them an advantage in, the, in, in moving up and in the community. So then they, he was able to practice his uh, priestly things. And so that gave, gave him an ability to earn a living in a different way and raise his children who, you know, all access higher education and then the next generation is all access in higher education and so on and you have three phds and they're going to oxford oxford schools i mean i talk like oxford and cambridge um not the university of the west indies so so i actually see it of great value because it, it, it the, the all the concepts cultural capital and, and the the forms of capital and how they relate to each other would be very useful in whatever field you're looking at. If you're looking at education or something else, I think the, the concepts themselves are very transferable, but you also have to ground it in the context of India. And if you're looking at specific province or a, a specific town and what is the history of that place and how does colonization impact that and you have to build that in. So I, I like I mentioned, I actually also used post-colonial theory along with Bodhya to sort of explain the context. I didn't use it in terms of my analysis in education, but to explain how inequality um, was structured over time during the colonial period and then how it evolved post-colonial. And, and I applied local concepts that we developed, you know, by people from Lloyd Braffitt from Barbados and the plantation economy was Lloyd Best, right? And because this is a plantation, plantation economy and plantation theory from Lloyd Best was very useful. So you will also have to look at local theories that you can marry with Bodian concepts to better understand your context. Thank you. What's your, your, what was your recommendation? Sorry, Amino, what was your, what was that comment? I, I must have missed it. Yeah, Ms. Samit asked, what was your recommendation in this paper? Pardon? What was your recommendation from your research? 
Oh, there was a bunch of recommendations. We we do we have uh, six hours? <laughs> but one one of my my main things was decolonizing the education system. That that was like the basis because my concern was really structural, the struct the macro structure. So even though I'm look I'm looking at individuals and I'm using certain concepts to understand their experience, we don't understand. The, the impact of the colonial legacy and the need to decolonize the education system. And so one of the things is a policy called the Concordat that was developed between the church and the government. And so it allows basically the rich people to, to allocate 20% of seats in the better schools for the wealthy people, regardless of your score in an exam, right? So it's built in inequality. Similarly, in Canada, inequality in religion and education is built into the constitution, right? So only Catholic and Anglican schools are funded in Canada. Whereas in Trinidad, all denominations are funded. It started off as Catholic and Anglican, but then with lobbying for Muslim and Hindu and other Christian denominations during like the early post-colonial period, everybody has, every religion has access to public funds. So yeah, um, that is part of the, the, what the main recommendation and a lot of the other recommendations flow from that. So the zoning policy and the um, to remove that zoning policy, it has really bad implications when people are not mixing. If all you are accessing is information from your local community, you are not learning, you're not growing. Students, I mean. So for the student who went to that school that she dropped out of, it was all students from very low income marginalized communities. She never, she never had access. What they also did is put students from what would have been junior, called junior secondary school, three-year schools in a separate class from the other students. So they were isolated from the other students in the secondary school. And they, then they were also marginalized in terms of the type of curriculum they were offered in that class. So there were different layers of inequity for those students coming into a different school that should have elevated them and instead they were kept marginalized. So there's different policies that, that has to be addressed in that context that needs to change um, the education system. But that's easy to say, but it's very difficult to do because even in Ontario, you know, we still have that issue here as well of streaming. And so there's been uh, attempts to de-stream, to uh, removing shop schools, like technical shop schools was one way to prevent streaming. Um, and I don't know how the success of that has been in Ontario, but but in your context, like if you, you have to really look at what requires change in your context. And this research shows there's other things that hasn't been addressed. So one is the policy that addressed the system, but then what about the legacies of intergenerational trauma? That is something that has not been addressed by government because first you have to recognize it to address it. And that is a big space, a big gap in the research that needs to be done. So there is the education system itself, but then there's broader societal issues that also has to be addressed by recognizing those colonial legacies. And Susama asks in the chat whether or not your dissertation is available anywhere or whether you could share it. Well, it's still being edited, but I do plan to publish. Uh, so that, that will be uploaded in the next couple of months and it should be public once I've submitted it. I've not officially submitted it yet. Excellent. Well, I'm sure lots of people will be interested based on the interest in, in your results and, and the discussion we're having now. I think a lot of people will be very interested to read the, the full dissertation and particularly the, the recommendations and discussion sections. Uh, Telly, did you have something further to add? Yeah, yes, just 
to agree with you about the 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 imperative of uh, engaging with the decolonization agenda and also that part of uh, the uh, colonization of the mindset was you know was through the uh, re uh, religion and you know religions were conserve were sites of uh, uh, socializing uh, uh, you know the oppressed into accepting um, their fate as it were um, in some uh, you know, uh, also uh, uh, you, you've had liberation theology, in, particularly in um, uh, uh, Latin America, uh, uh, and I suspect uh, there must have been um, uh, uh, certain elements of uh, the churches in in uh, in the Caribbean, or perhaps in uh, in Trinidad. I don't know. You know the details. Well, in Canada, you had the church here with the indigenous people, but I I, I mentioned that in the um, in the context chapter. But um, one of the reasons that I didn't mention here that that Arangues people didn't have a lot of access is they refused to convert, right? So that that makes you marginalized and make, you lose your access to, to primary school, for instance. So um, the Presbyterian Church in Canada came, came to Trinidad and, and they focused on the Indian people. So they didn't really look at the Black communities, the Afro-Trinidadians, they looked at the East Indians to save them. And so 10% were converted at one point. But the thing about it is it gave you access. So I could understand why people would do it. It gave you access to education and education uh, enabled them to move up. So when, when I looked around at the community, my community, I would see, because I'm from Arangos, I forgot to mention that. When I looked at it, I would see very, people in very prominent positions of East Indian background, but I couldn't understand why. Uh, but it was because they chose that pathway, right? So it was interesting. On the one hand, you, I also saw a lot of uh, some of the East Indians who also elevated educationally and in society were Brahmin. So, so that was also an interesting thing. So they had that cultural capital to move up and uh, also people who converted. So there's a lot of layers, like if you're looking at research in India, it, it would be even more layered and textured, right? So it was, it was sort of hard for me to sift the data to sort of focus on what to include in the research because there were many layers. All right, any further questions or comments? Feel free to unmute yourself and then ask. Seems like that, that might be it. This is your, your final chance if you wanted to ask a question. Looks like we've, we've run out of questions. So um, Sabita, thank you very much for, for giving this presentation. As, as you can see from the discussion that there's a lot of interest in this and I think it's, it's really in very valuable research that you've done. Um, so thanks very much. Thanks, Tristan. Thank you all for attending. I've just put some details in the chat about the, the upcoming events that we have. Um, we, we have a discussion group coming up next week. Um, and then after that, there's a presentation about social capital for youth economic uh, mobility. And then the following week after that, I'll be giving a presentation about the, the theoretical foundations and the meaning of social capital from, from different approaches. So you can, you can see the information about that on our website. Uh, so I'll end the recording now.